Good morning, class. Are we ready, uh, my brother? All right. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you for this privilege of studying together. We pray for your Holy Spirit's presence in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, good morning again. Uh, I... <laughs> Uh, some of the students have asked for a, a little time for questions and answers at the beginning of this period regarding our last class. So we will take a few minutes for that before we begin with uh, our study for this morning. Oh, Who would like to raise the first question? Oh, questions about past lecture? Uh, past, t t for our last lecture. Can we also ask uh, questions about the reading that we had with heresy two? So about with what? With the second heresy, can we ask questions about that too? Oh, about this morning's. Oh. That, that might be better to ask as we move along. All right. I guess the questions were about this morning's lesson, so we'll we'll begin that. But feel free to ask questions as we move along. Now. <coughs> Arthur White, the grandson of Ellen White, describes the second heresy, uh, the Holy Flesh heresy, as follows. He says, S.S. S. Davis, Indiana evangelist, crisscrossed the state in 1898 and 1899 bearing a cleansing latter rain message. This is what he called it. Demanding Holy Flesh. He assured perfect holiness and perfection of faith, of flesh. Even uh, claimed that the translation faith would heal the cripple and restore color to gray hair. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he held, had holy flesh. And so we must go through the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus did, and uh, when one goes through the garden according to his teaching, uh, he has holy flesh and cannot sin and cannot die. So that was a, quite a strong uh, doctrine. And when you hear of the holy flesh doctrine, you're hearing about this particular doctrine. Arthur White explains further, attempting to gain this garden experience that would give them holy flesh, the people gathered in meetings in which there were long prayers and strange, loud, sentiment, instructional, instrumental, I'm sorry, music, and excited, extended, hysterical preaching. It was expected that one, possibly more, would fall prostrate on the floor. And if that happened, then the men would gather that person and place them in front and they would be declared to have the garden experience. So he had a translation faith. Yes. They were uh, relating that to like uh, Gethsemane? Yes, there, yes. So what would happen is that under the emotional impact of this uh, excitement, one or another might fall over and then they would say, well, that's, they've gone through the garden. They have translation faith. <clears throat> Question? Ask, pardon me. So going through the garden experience they believe would get holy flesh so did Jesus, yes. is that how Jesus acquired holy flesh? That's, they, that's what they were teaching. He wasn't holy before that? Uh, pardon? He wasn't, they didn't believe he was holy before the garden? No, a holy flesh. Christ came with the nature of man mm -hmm. as it was when he came. Therefore he did not have holy flesh but his doctrine was that Christ acquired holy flesh through the Gethsemane experience 
that we also must have the holy flesh and therefore it must go through a Gethsemane experience. Now the Gethsemane experience he was talking about had nothing to do with the suffering of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, yes. What did he use to support that? Uh, I don't know all the, uh, all of that they would support it by, but there are many texts in the Bible which if used out of context and put together can have some some powerful. Uh, I'm sure one of the passages they must have used was uh, in First uh, John uh, chapter three, where it says, uh, "Those that have been born again do not sin." And uh, there are various texts in the Bible that could be used to to uh, appear to present this. Now, um, <clears throat> I think I passed by, um, well, I'm not sure where that uh, is, but uh, it says Haskell, one of the two, describes the meetings. Now, one of the two refers to a, a different slide, and I'm not sure what happened here, but I'll share with you what was on that slide. That slide has to do with the president of the conference at that time, warned all of his workers, uh, and by the way, uh, virtually all the ministers in the conference were accepting this view, and this was the basis uh, maybe I should go on another uh, that says well <clears throat> let me finish the other the uh, the uh, whole conference was pervaded with this and when they went to have their general conference meeting I'm sorry in their camp meeting which would have been about 18 uh, 99 I think he warned all of his workers now he says when the general conference men are here there would be two representatives of the general conference don't allow them to uh, to deflect you or to have too much influence because they don't know anything about the Gethsemane experience the garden exp experience one of those two was Elder Haskell and Elder Haskell reports, presumably the next one will, will be, um, it was before. It was before. Uh, oh, yes, uh, thank you. Elder Haskell reports that this was the strangest, this is the strangest doctrines I've ever heard. The seal of God cannot be placed on any person of gray hairs, or any deformed person. So that was the first but, but I thought before I said it could make colored hair or gray hair colored. Well, the, this is, has the same meaning. He's speaking of it on, on different tense. What they were teaching is this must happen. Now he's saying that because it must happen, those who do have gray hair, those who whose hair has not been changed, mm -hmm. and those who may still be deformed cannot re receive. So it's, it's confirming the same thing. For in the closing work, we would reach a state of perfection both physically and spiritually. And then they couldn't die. I said to Brother Breed, who I think was the other general conference representative, that I expected the next I would hear we could get a new set of teeth. <laughs> In this life, well, Brother Breed said, that was preached by some. So this was his report in writing to Ellen White. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Ellen White met this this uh, fanaticism as follows. Last January the Lord showed me that erroneous theories and methods would be brought into our camp meetings and that the history of the past would be repeated. I was instructed to say these demonstrations 
at these demonstrations, demons in the form of men are present, working with all the ingenuity that Satan can employ to make the truth disgusting to sensible people. Now, her statement was in October of, uh, of 1900. Heresy is always based on truth. And we need to understand that because today many people looking at the Holy Flesh movement feel like everything should be removed that they taught. But much of what they taught was true. Yeah. And we must not throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Holy Flesh actually was in the making for quite a number of years. And it had opposite roots. Interestingly enough, one of those roots was the Minneapolis message. The other was the holiness movement, which was at that very time reaching its climax, its zenith, as a decoy to lead away from truth. Whenever God has a message, Satan always has a counter message. And that counter message inevitably appears to have some of the same ingredients, and it actually does have some of the ingredients, appears to be the same thing. So he wants to, to misdirect people by taking that, the elements of truth and putting them in a false concept, uh, context. So the Minneapolis message was the latter rain message. It was designed to prepare people for the latter rain, the loud cry of the latter rain. But because they rejected it, this would not happen. But Satan in the meantime has prepared a counterfeit which he uses the Minneapolis message and those who have not truly accepted it, but maybe superficially, now he gets them to become involved in the counterfeit. His favorite trick is to invade every reformation. Whenever God works, you can be sure Satan will be right there working. Not alongside God in the sense of cooperating, but in the sense of, of sowing in the minds of people concepts that will lead them to form a counterfeit. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Ellen White says, error could not stand alone. This is something you might want to be sure and, and memorize. Error could not stand alone and would soon become extinct if it did not fasten itself like a parasite upon the tree of truth. Error draws its life from the truth of God. Now, so whenever you see fanaticism, remember there is truth, some truth there. Mm. So be careful how you relate to it. Don't allow yourself to accept the counterfeit, but be sure that you know that there are elements of truth that need to be preserved and doubtless will be very important elements of truth. Satan cannot destroy truth for it is eternal as God is and expresses his mind. That's what truth is, what God has thought and spoken into existence. To destroy truth's force, he takes great interest in every aspect to use to create heresies. It's one of the most important things for you to learn is that heresy is a mixture of truth and error. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, remember, was a mixture of good and evil. That's what evil is. There is no evil of and by itself. Satan is not a creator. He cannot create anything. All he can do is destroy what God has created. Confuse it. Distort it. And use it to deceive men. To this end, Satan prompts believers to go to extremes and imbalances that per pervert truth. 
extremism is just as serious as heresy. In fact, one of the purposes of heresy, primary purposes, is to foster extreme positions. But the person in reacting against the heresy may go to the opposite extreme position. And that is what he intends. The more vital the truth, the more sinister is the heresy or extreme. <coughs> Minneapolis agents themselves perverted the message by Pentecostal means. And this is a central issue of today's lesson. Satan's greatest triumph was in creating intractable conflict by stimulating unrecognized pride, which prompted Wagner and Jones to proclaim their message by violating the very principle uh, priesthood principles their message was supposed to produce. That message, a key element of that message was to produce a, a uh, priesthood of believer uh, uh, circumstance in which they would come together and pray together and seek the Holy Spirit together. Yet the Lord triumphed in their repentance because Wagner and Joan did truly repent. Thus the purpose of the message was accomplished. What was the purpose of the message? To humble in the dust the glory of man. And I turned it around from what has been here. To, to, to humble the glory of man in the dust. Now that purpose was accomplished for the time at least by their repentance and confession. This is something that, that uh, illustrated what the message was to be like and what it was to do. Their humble confession permitted him to bless their 1888 proclamation. And yet, the independence and pride they confessed had stimulated the pride of Smith and Butler, whose angry opposition uh, tested them and found them wanting of continual humility. In other words, Smith and Butler continued to oppose them and as they opposed them they failed to maintain their humble status and began to uh, war with Smith and Butler with uh, with attitudes and a spirit that could not be blessed. And it was this that ultimately led them into their own apostasy. The purpose of God, of course, was to humble the glory of man in the dust. And it had to begin with the proclaimers. Now what God would have chosen and what would have been best was for them to humble themselves in the dust beforehand and come to the brethren and uh, this may have resulted in totally different circumstances. Without this experience they would not be able to convey the message adequately to the hearers. So their message was really a message of humbling ourselves in the dust by receiving Christ's righteousness and by letting him and his spirit lead the mind and heart. That humility alone would permit God to complete his work on earth by swelling the loud cry message into the latter rain. But though powerfully proclaiming the message, the theology of the message, in ceasing to humble themselves, their attempts to produce the latter rain unwittingly sowed seeds that would spring up into in the holy flesh heresy. So what happened then is that pride and independence fostered a counterfeit of the message. And even as the message was resisted, 
Satan was preparing to produce his counterfeit. And the result was theological debates, uh, counterfeit, uh, charisma. Actually, I don't think that's the word I intended to put there. They counterfeited the message of Minneapolis. The transition from truth to holy flesh heresy was not caused by the Minneapolis message. It was due, rather, to a failure of its purpose to correct a legalistic tendency towards self-righteousness that obscured Christ, whose righteousness alone can prepare us to receive the latter rain. Wagner and Jones's commission was to shift the focus from the law, which is the standard of obedience and of righteousness, to Christ our only righteousness. We cannot produce ourselves the righteousness which God requires. Only by humbling ourselves and receiving Christ's righteousness, recognizing that our righteousness is filthy rags. Only this will permit uh, God to have his way in our life. By revealing the intimate union, unity between the law and grace that is seen only as we behold him who is truth and in whom the law and grace unite. Now, the fact is that there was a legalistic problem that needed to be solved. The focus was too sharply on the law. But the purpose of God was not to reduce the law, but to increase the focus on grace so the two united. And it's in this message that the two most completely unite. Our doctrines themselves are important, but they form a skeleton of truth that is essential to understand Christ crucified, who calls us to humbly take our cross and follow him. Even true uh, doctrines, however, become lethal when debate makes them the focus instead of Christ. No life or beauty can be seen in a skeleton. Indeed, just the appearance of a skeleton creates a very strong aversion. And when you see it, for instance, in a lab program where there's a skeleton, uh, if a person hasn't been there and seen it before, <laughs> their, their reaction might uh, be quite immediate in seeing that skeleton. The beauty of a skeleton is in hiding itself and giving contour and definition to the flesh which clothes it. Its function is to keep the organs, the blood vessels, the muscles, the nerves and all involved within the Bible, a body in a right relation, in a dynamic living whole. But we never want to see the skeleton or any part of it. So, to make sure we understand this clearly, let's repeat this again. The doctrines of the Bible form the skeleton. We don't want to focus on the skeleton. But we do want to focus on the living reality which is based and upheld and made possible by the skeleton. So the skeleton is no less important. Its importance, however, is not in its dominant appearance. And this is what the Minneapolis message was to do, was to provide the basis for giving us a focus on Christ. And everything about the message, everything about the doctrines should focus on, not on themselves, but on Christ. And there is a... Uh, <clears throat> 
such that thus the Minneapolis message was to unite every doctrine to revolve interdependently around Christ the head. Notice interdependently, not independently. So every doctrine properly presented will be a presentation of Christ. This not only relates to the doctrines one to another, and by the way, this is that the doctrines must unite and show the interrelation. When you study the, the body, you study how the different glands and, uh, and organs function in harmony with each other, what effect each one has. But it not only shows this relation one to another, but it shows how to relate to Christ himself and to each other how we relate to each other in, in a true priesthood of believers. Wagner and Jones thus offered the depth of our doctrines, making each of them more honorable by relating it to him who is truth. Now, this was their purpose, this was their message, yet the theology can become even more lethal than doctrine if a debating atmosphere diverts the mind from Christ to theories about him, instead of a skeleton, we end up with a smelly corpse. <laughs> now, the fact is, uh, the difference between doctrine and theology that we've been talking about here is doctrine has to do with the skeleton, and theology has to do with how we relate the different pieces to each other. Theology has to do with how different doctrines relate and, and how these relate to Christ. So we need both doctrine and we need theology. The word theology uh, means, uh, has to do with theos, which is God, and ology, which has to do with the study of God. So we need to understand how every doctrine relates to each other doctrine, and how it relates to Christ, and how we are to relate to each other. The effectiveness of a theology uh, centered on Christ depends entirely on its practical application in humble, growing, personal relationship to him. Wagner thus wisely refused to debate at Minneapolis. At the beginning, his opponents said, well, let's choose, let's choose sides for debating this. You, you have your side, we'll have ours, and we'll debate this. Wagner said, no. He was right. We do not debate principle, uh, uh, religious and spiritual principles because that only results in each side wanting to prove the other one wrong, to prove themselves right. Our purpose in giving this message is to reveal Christ, is to focus upon Christ, not upon ourselves. Yet the resistors to Wagner did force debate. This was unfortunate. There needed to be a time of spiritual focus in which they were pleading for the Holy Spirit to guide them. Instead, the opponents began to debate uh, technical issues in the book of, of Galatians, and the res result was uh, that it produced spiritual death and st for those who got caught up in the deba debate or confused by it, rather than the life that results from knowing him who is truth. This is life eternal, Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, 3, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And the knowledge here is not knowledge about Christ and the Father. It's knowing them personally. And there's a lot of difference between the two. The core of that life-giving experience of union with him is humility. It alone gives victory over the independent human spirit that threatened both sides of the debate. In the absence of deepening humility, the latter rain could not fall. 
but intense effort to produce the latter rain after the message was given by stirring the emotions in what was thought to be the moving of the spirit only delayed the object of the Minneapolis message. So what happened was following Minneapolis, the people still wanted the latter rain. And therefore, even Jones and Wagner became caught up in a methodological process which would prevent the latter rain, not bring it, bring it about. So we're now going to discuss this borrowed holiness movement. When God prepared the message through Wagner and Jones, the enemy of truth immediately began to prepare his counterfeit holiness movement. Was the Minneapolis message to result in a holy life? Yes. Did the Minneapolis message call for victory over sin in order to receive the Holy Spirit? Yes. So Satan has his own holiness movement. But the whole focus is holiness. The focus is no longer Christ, but the holiness which results from, from beholding Christ. So, <clears throat> as early as 1884, Wagner began to present his message. At the same time, the holiness movement was developing. In 1844? Er, Pardon? 1884? 1884. The, that same movement was starting. Uh, pardon? The holiness flesh movement was starting to rise up in 18... Not the holiness flesh movement, the holiness movement. The holiness movement was the evangelical movement which Satan caused to be developed outside the church in order to draw people to that instead of to the message of the, of the Minneapolis message. But they're very different messages. And, and I'll tell you, many Adventists have been caught up in the holiness movement. Some directly, some indirectly. But whenever the focus is primarily upon holiness or victory and so forth, that is a part of the holiness system. The focus needs to be on Christ, who produces the holiness. But this is a clever way of moving attention away and also moving attention away from the, from the personality of the Holy Spirit and treating the Holy Spirit as an emotion. The Holy Spirit is not an emotion. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is not how you feel. And the fact is the holiness movement is based upon a false concept of the Holy Spirit and a failure, and a failure to keep the focus on Christ. If we focus on holiness itself, we will never become holy. We'll become self-righteous. And that will be a very serious thing. So the, holy, the, the Minneapolis message was designed to bring about holiness. But that holiness would be a product of receiving Christ's righteousness and keeping the focus on him. We do need, you see, the real problem within Adventism, God has given us a message and Satan has seen to it that he has he has split that message into two principles rather than having the two combined. One principle focused on obedience and holiness. The other on Christ and grace. But neither one will operate. They have to be united. And that's what the Minneapolis message did. Amen. Was to unite these two principles together. And so what Satan is constantly seeking to do is to cause us to either focus on holiness, on obedience to God's law, or else causing us to focus on, on grace and faith so that we disconnect these, neither one operates properly. 
It's when these two principles come together in our minds, in our hearts, that victory takes place. And the victory then becomes his victory. But he treats it as our victory. It is both his and ours because we unite the divine and the human and the result is the victory that we have longed for. Now, it is generally felt that by 1893, when the confession uh, of Butler was made, that the opposition to the Minneapolis message was finished and everyone united, and they all preached the message. This is the general understanding within the church. The fact is, that is not true. It is true that by that time, Smith and Butler had both confessed their error, but what did they confess? They confessed that their attitude was wrong, their spirit was wrong, and that their opposition to Ellen White was wrong. They did not confess to any rejoicing in the message. And the fact is, to his dying day, Uriah Smith held that the greatest tragedy ever taking place within Adventism was Wagner's message. He wrote that to a friend just be shortly before he died. Now that confession then was not an evidence of true conversion. It was an evidence of recognizing his error but there was no conversion in the sense of joining in presenting that message. Smith resisted it all the way and we'll see if our time doesn't run out on us, we'll see Smith again in his uh, uh, jousting with Jones and seeking to put Jones down and his message. The, unfortunately, the confessions of most of the key people tended to be the same, a superficial confession which did not cause them to rejoice in the message, but simply to recognize they'd gone too far in their opposition and in their attitudes and so forth. Now, more serious than this were the methods of Wagner and Jones which, while they were trying to induce the latter rain, which hadn't happened, and when they were trying to do this, they were attracted to the holiness movement. Jones began to study the holiness works quite early after the 1888 message. We don't know just when, but in 1898, as our own holiness movement was moving toward its climax, he announced that for two or three years he had been studying the works of F.B. Myers and the Keswick Conf uh, movement. These were two of the most of the key uh, uh, key. Uh, what should I say? Two of the dominant forces within the counterfeit message, the holiness movement. <clears throat> In his discussion at the 1893 General Conference about uh, Hannah Whitehall, however, who was one of the key uh, writers. In fact, her works are even, rep uh, even recognized today as being Im very important. So, she was one of the most popular uh, of the holiness writers and is to this day. He does suggest that, that the, uh, I, I guess that's our next time. Uh, he does suggest, however, that her works 
were not adequate because there were two problems. And uh, first of all, the holiness approach diverted attention from their own third angel's message, loud cry message. The focus on holiness and the spirit muted the judgment hour message and uh, it was designed to produce holiness by the Holy Spirit. The fact is that holiness does take place by the Holy Spirit, but it is a person, the Holy Spirit, who is working with Christ, who is a person whose righteousness we must claim. And uh, I note here that this coincided with Jones and Wagner's own faulty concept of the role of the Spirit. We will be talking about that later. But they developed a false concept of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the movements that I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, and perhaps we'll have some time to, to work on that before the class is over, is the anti-Trinitarian that denies the personality of the Holy Spirit and denies that Christ is equal with the Father as divine. The fact is both of these points were at stake here and the key thing had to do with confusion regarding the Holy Spirit as an emotion rather than as a person. Yet they were drawn to the emotional methods, even though they recognized the inadequacy and, and believed that uh, uh, desire of ages and steps to Christ and so forth were, were more completely giving the message. Yet they were drawn to the methods of the holiness movement and they they uh, did see that the holiness message detracted from the loud cry message. And I guess this is where I present the information I've just given. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> some of the dangers we face today have to do with efforts to produce the latter rain. As a matter of fact, we have within our midst many who are seeking constantly to figure out some new idea or some new way to bring about the latter rain. And a couple of the others that we have, have mentioned have to do with the feast days, have to do with the futurism, have to do with anti-trinity. These are things that have attracted the attention of some of our people in their effort to find something that will produce what only the Spirit of God can produce when we focus upon Christ. The holiness danger then is now more extensive even than it was then. Not only does it penetrate virtually all the Protestant bodies, but it links them to the Roman Catholic system and Eastern religions. Before we're finished, we'll have a chance to talk about this, where we're talking about the New Age. Moreover, the popularity of panentheism, uh, which we will study in chapter 11, is more universal and diverse today than it was then, and many of its uh, representations interpenetrate the holiness movement of today. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the holiness movement has united, virtually united Protestantism and Catholicism. And this is what Ellen White says, under the influence of spiritualism, the clasping of the hands between uh, Romanism and Protestantism, and that has virtually taken place today. It certainly is rapidly completing. Could you go back for a brief second? Yes. Thank you. All right. Now, 
We're going to discuss now Jones's relationship or understanding of the of the spirit. This will uh, still be uh, just a general discussion because I will discuss the specifics more later. But in the Dime Tabernacle, which is the tabernacle that was uh, built by the use of dimes from all over the church, Prescott and Jones decided to introduce a new prophet. That prophet was Anna Phillips, whose name was sometimes called Anna Rice. There was a Pastor Rice who adopted, they adopted her, not formally, but in terms of relationships, and oftentimes she was called Anna Rice. But Anna Phillips had the impression that she was a new prophet. And uh, Jones and Prescott were eager to introduce her to Adventism. So what did they do? One of them would read a statement from Ellen White and they would ask the people, what voice do you hear? And the people would undoubtedly say, well, the voice of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The other one would read, read a similar statement by Anna Phillips and raise the same question, what voice do you hear? Well, the people, recognizing the statements were pretty much the same, would say, the Spirit. And they would do one after another. In the process, they were training the people to believe that Anna Phillips is now a new prophetess in the Adventist movement. Now, this, very fortunately, as as uh, Jones went to the post office right afterward, he had a letter from where? From Australia. Ellen White is speaking to him, and she reproves him for doing what he's just finished doing. The interesting thing, that letter had been in process for several months, about three months. It had been delayed in its process, and it was delayed in the providence of God so that Ellen White's reproof would take place and would arrive just after the fulfillment of what she said would have taken place, had just taken place. Well, as a result of that, Jones was very penitent, and, and, and uh, acknowledged, he came back to the same group and told them that he was mistaken. And the next Sabbath he preached in the same church, the tabernacle, and again he confessed. He said, I was wrong, and I've confessed, now I'm right. But to be wrong and then to be right involves more than just a short period of repentance it requires something more and that something more Jones did not acquire it, 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 it requires a new ongoing relationship with Christ that will keep a person from doing what they've just done now in September 1893 at Lansing, Michigan before this ever happened, and let me say this, that the General Conference President had been urging Jones not to introduce Anna Phillips. And for a long time, he didn't. But Jones was so eager to push forward the work, and he was convinced that she was uh, to be accepted as a prophet, that he there began by teaching the people and preparing them to accept her by teaching that there were going to be many prophets and that we would have to test those prophets by hearing the voice. And uh, he, his, his uh, test then was, if you hear the voice, 
you can be sure that it is true because even if Satan were to quote scripture he could not imitate the voice now I want you to notice that Jones considered himself to be the agent of the Holy Spirit and whatever his thinking was to him seemed to be the voice and this is the problem that would eventually lead him into infidelity God had blessed Jones he had blessed both Wagner and Jones but both men began to think of themselves as the voice that you might say of the Holy Spirit and they were convinced that their thinking represented the voice of the Spirit meanwhile Wagner went even further he insisted that all of God's people were to become prophets now you notice if these kinds of messages are being given that we're in dangerous ground that these men have been given a message God has blessed them but now they're becoming self-confident instead of sensing their weakness and waiting for the Holy Spirit to truly guide them they became uh, presumptuous in assuming that their thoughts were guided by the Holy Spirit so it says that Jones focus had been on Anna as a new prophetess for most of a year in December of 1892 Jones received a message from Anna that message was a testimony to him that he had a special role that God had given him and, and uh, as a result of her message to him well it seems self-evident that he was, had a special role and so from that point on he was eager to announce her so notice this was several nearly a year beforehand that this happened he enthusiastically affirmed her gift and urged her to write her testimonies and it is these testimonies that he and Prescott had presented several months later in the Dime Tabernacle so I mentioned here after in September of 1893 and the other was December of 92 so you see we've come about uh, what is that about nine months after chafing over President Olson's firm counsel not to announce Anna he publicly read one of her testimonies and this is before the Dime Tabernacle experience in which the conference president at that meeting said that there wasn't one in a hundred that could distinguish the, the testimonies now I wanted to to try to remember the name of the man who very recently from from just a few miles uh, west of us claimed to be a prophet does anyone remember his name? Oh, um, it was Eric. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get that name. It's just uh, a very short time ago. He and his wife attended our Colfax Church, and they wanted to have their membership changed to the Colfax Church. But earlier than this, one of our our uh, students here had asked me to check this out I had never heard of him before he says he claims to be a prophet and so forth here read his vision and tell me what you think of it when I finished reading his vision I told our student that it definitely was not something he should accept there were several earmarks evident to me uh, that this was not a new prophet yet many of the expressions in that 
testimony sounded just like Ellen White. In fact, many of them were, were virtual quotations, but then their, his own context. I told him no. I told him no. This this would not be. This is not it does not have evidence of being an authentic prophet. Well, now in the meantime, as he brought his request for membership, I encouraged the the uh, church to go slow on this. That I felt that there was a serious problem, and uh, we were not able to deal with it until a certain board meeting. By that time, he confessed publicly that he was a fraud. Mm -hmm. One of his most aggressive helpers, the one who was helping him the most, finally became suspicious and demanded answers from him, which resulted eventually in him saying, no, I did not have visions. Mm -hmm. The fact is that one of the most important reasons why I knew immediately was it was sensationalism. Now, Ellen White presents very graphically some of the issues that we face, but she does not do it sensationally. She does not dwell on the, the detail and so forth, which, uh, which was true in this. Furthermore, I found a very significant evidence that he was not a true prophet in his obvious attempt to get them to, to send their tithe to him. Uh, but he did this by saying that the time has come when everyone should decide for themselves where they send their tithe and they should send it to the ones they most trust. And in the context of this was really a matter of holding his hands out and saying I can be trusted, send it to me. Now, the fact is that he received considerable funds as a result of this, and this was uh, a, a means of, of acquiring funds. Jones saw no need to test this presumed gift. Why did he not need to test it? Because he heard the voice. He knew the voice. What he did not know, it's his own voice he was hearing. Not the voice of the Spirit. Even, he did not seek counsel from anyone, even from Ellen White. To do so would to him have seemed to be a lack of confidence or a doubt in the voice which he was not able to do. Now, we must always test the voice. There are two voices that continually speak to us. And each voice wants us to hear and follow. Christ speaks through his Holy Spirit. Satan speaks through his spirits. And oftentimes in such a way as to confuse the issue at best or to cause a person to believe that God is guiding them when he is not. So whenever there is a, a, a prophet that, or a prophet who is, uh, who is introduced, we need to be exceedingly careful. There are tests and those tests must be followed very carefully. In Oregon some years ago, there was a, a, a group of people who were uh, uh, formed a little group in which they thought that the boy, a small boy, was a prophet. And before they were through with it, he was leading them not only to slash the tires of the cars in the supermarket, but he actually led them to kill someone. That is a spirit, all right, but not the spirit of Christ. Was that within Adventism? Yes. <coughs> yeah, well, then not uh, okay. It was it was a, a cultish group. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, beware of cults. 
there are many who claim that Adventism is a cult, and there are occasionally some cults that develop from any given uh, church they can develop. But be very careful not to become involved in any kind of extreme position. And recognize that cults are Satan's great agencies to lead people into various kinds of counterfeits. Now, <clears throat> it is obvious that Jones and Prescott, who asked the people, you know, what voice do you hear, could not discern the Holy Spirit's voice from their own impressions. And that should be a lesson to all of us because we are not going to be any better at that than they. That means that we do need a priesthood, a believer process in which we, we consult with one another and we prayerfully bring things before God before accepting them. Now God chose to expose the presumption of his ardent servant Jones. Jones was sincere but he was presumptuous. He did not take time to test and, and he was, he was self-confident. He failed to respond to other testimonies that were designed to remove his self-confidence and prevent public disgrace. We've discussed some of the areas in which he was cautioned. But in some of those areas, he never did accept the testimonies uh, that warned him against the extreme positions. As a result, he became self-confident. Well, he was self-confident by nature. You and I are self-confident by nature. And he became more and more self-confident. But the interesting thing, God was slow. He, t he waited a year uh, before allowing Jones to expose himself. In the meantime, other testimonies were given to him which if he had responded to would have caused him to move away from his self-confident independent spirit and would have caused him to, to begin to uh, ask what voice am I following? To awaken him to the danger of individualism and self-confidence, God delayed the arrival of the message until after he had exposed his problem. But before that, he gave him a long period of time to recognize it himself. But the message was deliberately delayed so that it would create a profound impression upon him that would help him to put himself in the right relationship to, of, of dependence upon Christ. <clears throat> Ellen White wrote to him, Did you suppose that God had commissioned you to take the burden of presenting the visions of Anna Phillips, reading them in public and uniting them with the testimonies the Lord has been pleased to give me? No, the Lord has not laid upon you this burden. But she also insisted that though he was self-confident, he was ardent. And she writes, I am indeed sorry both for Brother Prescott and Brother Jones. I felt very anxious in regard to them both. But especially in regard to Brother Jones who is so ardent in his faith and does not manifest the caution he should in his statements by pen or voice. I did pray that these dear brethren would be so completely hid in Christ Jesus that they would not make one misstep. So there's a process. God gave a message to Wagner which Jones joined in and God blessed them both. But as time went on they began to see themselves as being special agents 
and uh, as a result of their of their growing independence they failed to test so Ellen White says that he was quick to see the light but too self-confident to carefully test to make sure it was the message she says, I have most tender feelings toward our brethren who have made this mistake, and I would say that those who depreciate the ones who've accepted reproof will be permitted to pass through trial which will make manifest their own individual weaknesses and defects of character. This is her response to the critics who were quick to pick this up as evidence that the original message must not have been right. And then she says, Brother Jones and Prescott are the Lord's chosen messengers, beloved of God. They have cooperated with God and for the work for this time. While I cannot endorse their mistakes, I am sympathy, in sympathy and union with them in their general work. The Lord sees that they need to walk in meekness and lowliness of mind before him and learn the lessons which will make them more careful in every word they utter and in every step they take. So, the problem with, that Ellen White faced was now that they've made this serious problem, a serious mistake, now their enemies were beginning to say, well, this is proof that the message they got, bore was false. This is the fruit of that message. Ellen White says, no, don't think that. If you think their failure now uh, was a result of the message, you will face yourself trials that will expose your weaknesses. God allows us all to face challenge. He is patient when he calls a person to work for him. He always recognizes that person must be trained. And they will make mistakes. The important thing is in that training process that we continue to receive reproof and humble ourselves. So Jones was still a messenger who is beloved of God. To Jones and to Prescott, Ellen White wrote, do not spread abroad writings of this character without more consideration and deep insight as to the after consequences of your course of action. So God deliberately allows us to make mistakes to cause us to depend on him more. It is not, uh, God does not take quick action when a, one of his workers fails. He is ca uh, patient with them and seeks to train. If they're willing to repent and continue to be corrected, he will guide them and purify them in that process. To Ellen White's critics, she wrote, these brethren are God's ambassadors. They have been quick to catch the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness and have responded by imparting heavenly light to others. If they have felt afraid to refuse that which bore the appearance of being a light, if they have grasped too eagerly that which has been misleading, believing it to be the counsel of God, should anyone be disposed to find fault, to criticize or complain, when they now acknowledge that they have not been as careful as they should have been to distinguish the tendency of the testimony that had been the appearance of divine. So the question is, do they have a right to criticize them? Here they have already repented and they have confessed the wrong. So those who are, were opposed to them before we're happy to see them fail in order to uh, uh, confirm their own opposition to the message. I think this must be a repetition of what I've just read. Uh, the question to the opponents, uh, if they think they have the right to do that. What a contrast between participants. To this point, Jones and Wagner have repented when, when they've been reproved. But 
those who took advantage and, and did indeed uh, seek to establish that this proved their message was not the true message, but that this was the fruit of a, of a heretical message. Those brethren had gone six years by this time and had failed to, to really grasp the light. Indeed, they had heard the, that voice. Had they heard that voice, in other words, the voice of the true Holy Spirit, they would have seen in their brethren's failure cause for their own repentance. Because what had they done? They had actually set the brethren outside the priesthood of believers by instead of consulting with them, instead of praying with them, instead of studying with them, they opposed them and in their opposition to them caused them to feel that whatever they had in their minds must be true and their opposition automatically was opposition to the Spirit which means that they confuse the Spirit of God with their own spirit. Indeed, those who criticize others' failures inevitably reveal that they do not themselves hear the voice. For in the failure of others is God's call to each to search his own heart, taking heed lest he fail, uh, lest he fall. Ellen White consistently insisted that they needed each other. Now, I will have to just share with you briefly what we're not, we will not have time to cover now, but that is that Jones wrote a whole series of articles insisting that the beast has now been formed, the, mark, uh, the image to the beast has now been formed. And on the basis of things that were happening then, he insists that that is already taken place. And for a period of, of uh, probably at least three years, he insisted on the image of the beast having been formed. There's nothing more that needs to be done. We're going. The very next thing will happen is the wrath of God will take place. Now, in the meantime, Smith, who is with working with him in the review. At this point, uh, Jones has, has been brought in as editor of the review. And Smith, instead of talking to Jones and, and helping Jones see that this was a premature thing for him because there were real reasons why to believe that this was not the image of the beast. Instead of talking to Jones about it, he, he was eager to allow him to continue his series and at the end he presented his evidence that this was false. So what happened then with Smith eager to, to, uh, to, to unite with, in presenting a true message? His main purpose right now is to put down Jones. And it's one of the evidences that Smith did not truly repent of his opposition to the message. This was not the first time, however, that he... Uh, I'll just... we we'll maybe just have time, perhaps it's time now to quit. Yes, well, you'll find this in your book. But over and over again, he insisted that the beast had been formed. And now it was just a matter of time for the life to be given to the beast. And the next thing would be for the plagues. Now, Ellen White reproved Jones, but she very severely reproved Smith. Because rather than following the priesthood of believer pattern of coming to Jones humbly and discussing the issues with him prayerfully. He eagerly put this in the review to expose Jones's error. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you for your many blessings.
Teach us to know and to love and serve you. Help us to learn from the lessons of these men of the past, realizing these men were just plain men who were called to do a great work, who did a great work but often spoiled it because they became independent. Help us to realize that any independence on our part is going to be met with, with unfortunate results. Guide and direct, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, I would like to have finished that with Jones, but you will have it in the book. Uh, brethren, we need to appreciate these men for what they, what they were, but we also need to realize that no one not even a general conference president is to be looked to in the sense of that we are not aware that they're just men. And when they violate the principles, they, the results are just as sure as it would be for the janitor in a small church. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that their mistakes are such an example to us. Because we're, I was just thinking how, like, they were living at such a critical time and Satan saw that. Oh, yeah. We threw every single heresy at them that we could. How much more today, if we are living in the last days, if there is a true message to the Christ's second coming, how much more will Satan try to take our key leaders? That's and true. Us, right? and That's true. Us, yes, and our present. Ministry Magazine editor is a case in point. He is the editor, but he has been severely opposed because before he realized what was happening in the New Age thing, he began to echo some of their expressions and so forth. However, as soon as he found out what that system really represented, he repudiated it quickly. And the fact is that men of God are not guaranteed a passageway without failure. And we need to be cautious not to follow a leader, but to follow God's word. But also not to be too quick to condemn a leader. We may have to experience the same failures ourselves in order to understand uh, what's involved. Well, God bless it. Thank you, Dr. Yes, thank you. Uh, That's the more. What happened to Jones in the end?